This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 1539. The easiest way to get a raise is to give yourself one by Kirsten Saunders of richandregular.com. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. This is the show where I read to you from the best personal finance blogs on the web, with the author's permission, of course. And if you're looking for some financially minded friends, check out the Facebook group I run called For the Fi Curious. This is a joint group between Optimal Finance Daily and the Economy Conference, which is an event I produce. In this group, we aim to inspire you on your path to financial independence, so I like to share interesting articles, quotes, and thought-provoking questions to ponder together. Just search for Optimal Finance Daily and you'll quickly find the Facebook group called For the Fi Curious. But for now, let's get right to it and continue optimizing your life. The easiest way to get a raise is to give yourself one by Kirsten Saunders of richandregular.com. As Mr. r r mentioned, I got promoted, woohoo! Some of you may be thinking, wait, I thought y'all were retiring early. You're right, but the two events aren't as mutually exclusive as they sound. We treat full-time employment, which is required work where you trade time for money, as a season. We still believe that life is for living, which is why we actively avoid lifestyle inflation in spite of how lucrative our careers have been over the years. Taking this approach trains us to treat salary increases as a byproduct of how focused we are at reducing the timeline and not another form of golden handcuffs. The title is a bit of a spoiler alert about who I think the onus falls on for making additional income. But leveraging our employers to earn more money has been an important part of our journey. So let's talk about it. Earning more money hinges on your ability to understand people, which is the emotional work known as office politics, also known as the game. It's the thing where you agree to a never ending feedback loop. You make a point to solicit feedback at very specific times, and then you act on that feedback in very specific ways. You play the game and you hope for the best. In the wrong environments, it becomes exhausting and leads to burnout. The right environment can lead to incredible mentorship, the ability to learn new things and rapid salary growth. This has been the case for me. If my current salary is a scoreboard and every promotion is considered a checkmate, then it's fair to say that I have played the game well. I just don't wanna play it for 30 more years. Apley stated, quote, when you work for someone else, you implicitly accept a limited upside and unlimited downside. For a long time, I didn't understand how limited the upside was. I was a tried and true careerist, but I also thought the game we were all playing was chess. Turns out it's poker, end quote. Don't get me wrong. I'm great at my job and have earned my place, but so did the people I've seen lose theirs. My point is that I'm not special. I've just been lucky enough to avoid the downside. Annie Duke talks about the difference between chess and poker in her book. With chess, there's no hidden information. All the pieces are visible and you can see your opponent's moves and react accordingly. If you lose, it's because there were better moves that you didn't make or see. You can learn from your losses in chess, so it makes sense to keep trying. In other words, the juice is worth the squeeze because the game is fair, but poker is different. Poker is a game of chance where valuable information is hidden. Your actions will always be based on the likelihood that something will happen. You don't know which cards will be dealt or which hands will be played. You can still make the best decision based on the information you had and still lose. In fact, there's so much uncertainty involved in poker that it makes it really difficult to learn from the past. You don't know which outcomes were a result of your skills and which ones were a result of luck. You can use your experience as a guide, but to excel, it requires you to be comfortable with the fact that you don't control the odds and still be willing to play all in. That sounds like a 50-year career to me. It sounds bleak, so we develop these narratives that normalize the risk as a way to cope. We start to call our colleagues family, and instead of simply respecting company policies, we operate if we had an obligation to unconditionally support them even at our own expense. So many of us are agreeing to spend the best years of our lives playing career poker 40 plus hours a week, knowing the house will always win. We spend all year toiling to drive clicks to websites just to grow the pot. 
We go all in with our time and hope that we're holding the winning hand during the annual review and bonus process. Year after year after year, wagering our health for 2% here, 5% there. Sometimes we win, other times we lose, but we keep on playing year after year after year. 2% here, 5% there. The only way to consistently win a game of chance is to master the odds. That said, the easiest way to ensure you get the raise you deserve is to give it to yourself. If you're an employee like I am, one of the best things you can do with your paycheck is to build a routine that conditions it to work harder for you. Assign every dollar a job, manage it like you would an employee, and invest in systems that create new income with minimal demands on your time. Our paychecks played a significant role in our journey to FI, but our net worth has increased by over 100,000 so far this year because we always pay ourselves first. For the last five years, we've given ourselves a raise two to three times more often than our employers did, and not just through real estate, certainly not this year. Quote, our raises come from being bullish about the unsexy realities of staying rich. We call them our rituals, end quote. Tasks like reducing expenses that don't align with our values, buy cable, consolidating insurance, revisiting deductibles, avoiding fees, and managing our investment costs by converting to Admiral shares in Vanguard all add up. I'm not gonna lie, it can be frustrating to sift through fine print and it's mind numbing to keep pressing zero until you get the right representative, but eventually you get used to it and build the same tolerance you use to sit in another meeting that should have been an email at work. The bottom line is that no one will advocate for your money like you will. Jen Cicero says it best, quote, if you're ready to make more money, you can. You just have to do the math and master the odds, end quote. Since Mr. r r started his mini retirement, we're down to one paycheck, but we feel richer. The money he earned during his employment still goes to work every day while he gets to spend more time with the people he loves doing the things he loves. Now that's what I call playing to win. You just listened to the post titled, The Easiest Way to Get a Raise is to Give Yourself One by Kirsten Saunders of richandregular.com. I like this article because it reminds me of a time that I used to think getting ahead financially was solely based on increasing my salary at work. And don't get me wrong, that is certainly a part of it. But I've realized over time that how I manage the money I already have has had a much bigger impact on building wealth. I also often ponder the fact that we understand the importance of diversifying our investments to manage risk, but we rarely consider the risk involved in having our income come from one source, our employer. I used to think that as long as I was a high performer at work, my income was safe, and that increasing my income was solely dependent on doing a good job. But a lot of times, keeping your job or getting a raise isn't so objective. It's dependent on another person's subjective opinion of you. And while you can get better at playing the game, there's a lot here that's out of your control. I've seen in my own career that there's a lot of risk when your income is dependent on trading time for money. And the best way to manage this risk is by using that money you do earn to buy assets. Think of those assets such as stocks and real estate as the best colleagues you'll ever have because they will always be able to work harder than you can at earning more money. And over time, the income you can derive from your assets will exceed the income you can earn from trading your time for money, significantly lowering the risk of the employment game. I really like how Kirsten described W-2 employment as a season, because when you can frame it this way, you can see it as a stepping stone rather than something you're required to participate in for most of your life. And that should do it for today. Have a happy rest of your day and I'll see you on the Friday show tomorrow where your optimal life awaits.